Thank you, Luisa, for the invitation and for having this moment and sharing with you some, some thoughts that I think all of us we know, but sometimes we have to remember and, and keep the memory on. Um, I try to connect uh, ecumenism and the situation of the contemporary New Zealand today. First of all, when we talk about ecumenism, um, it's interesting what, because we are celebrating Autonom Sint, what uh, John Paul II talked about it, and he said it's not an appendix of Catholic's life, but a serious and important commitment. And I think this is important because sometimes I feel that um, we Catholics, we think that the communism is not necessarily a part of our Christian life, like it's an appendix, like an accident, like, you know, theologians take care of communism, and personally I live my Christian life. While I think these words shows us, show us that they're important, because the Pope says it's an organic part of the life and work of the church, organic. So, to live ecumenism is really to live our vocation of being Christians, of being Catholics. It's to live our mission also. So, but of course we have to ask, okay, if now I understand the Pope is saying, our, the teaching of the church says, okay, it's, it's an organic part, it's something constitutive. So, what is ecumenism? Uh, the, um, there is a document of a common understanding of our vision from the World Council of Churches, which try to define what is ecumenism. And they affirm, is the search for visible unity, not as an end itself, but in order to give credible witness so that the world may believe. The churches agreed that the term ecumenical embraces the quest for Christian unity, common witness in the worldwide task of mission and evangelism, and commitment to diaconia service, and the promotion of justice and peace. I think it's a very broad definition of what is ecumenism. But at the same time, we have to ask first, what is this visible unity that we are looking for? So, it's interesting because what we think of ecumenism at the end is what we think about the church. So, our vision of ecumenism has a strong link with our vision of our own ecclesiology, of our own vision of the church. And do you know that it is important to see that, of course, there has been a development in our understanding of ecumenism, in particular within the Catholic Church, but really also uh, all over the, the, the different churches. And it has been a development also in ecclesiology because, and that's why I think is what type of unity we are searching for? This is the first question. What type of unity? Some theologians have used geometrical sim geometric symbols to describe the mystery of the church and to describe also how to live ecumenism. So if we see, for example, at what the situation before Vatican II, before the Council, we can see that the vision of our church was like a pyramid church. The pyramid church was a very, a very strong hierarchical vision of the church in which we consider the church as an institution. So it was a very, of course, it was after the reformation. So it was a very apologetic uh, response to the situation of the division of the churches. And the Catholic Church tried to affirm its own identity, in one way protecting its own identity, and said, okay, it's the institution, and the institution is a very organized, and it was very well defined, an organized institution in which you have the Pope at the top, then cardinals, bishops, priests, deacons, laity. So, in this 
and what was the relationship with other churches. It was very interesting because more or less the principle was extra ecclesiam nulla salus. So outside the church, there is no salvation. And that's a vision of my grandmother. I remember my grandmother. So the vision was extra ecclesiam, so outside the church, there is no salvation. And if we remember the dogmas of Trent and, and the Councils, it was, if you don't believe that the Catholic Church is the unique, the, the truth, the only one, anathema sia. No? You are anathema. So it was a very institutional vision of the church, very restricted, and outside, you have no salvation. So I remember my grandma was very worried because one of the uh, sons was not so believer and left the church and she, and she said he will go to hell. You know, so the one who was outside the church had no salvation. Actually, they, they were um, threatened by condemnation. So it was a very, and that is why, for example, that vision of the, of the children who, who were born or who, who died without baptism. So that's why many uh, theologians created this idea of the limbo in which the, the children who had no baptism, they went to a, they didn't go to hell because it was what, what, in, what an innocent little child will do in hell if he didn't do anything and he didn't sin. So we created this imagine, imaginary idea of a limbo in which the children who was, were not baptized went to this limbo. So it was a very restrictive idea uh, pre-Second Vatican Council. Um, it's interesting what happened with Vatican Second Council. Of course, John uh, 23rd had an incredible vision. He wanted to seek the unity of, 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 of Christians. And he said, many elements of sanctification and of truth are found outside its visible structure. These gifts belonging to the Church of Christ are forces impelling towards Catholic unity. The vision, and, and, and we created a, an image. I remember this was my stage, my, my education when I was a student of theology. And I remember I was taught, I was, I was, I was born in 1968. Now you will guess my age. Okay, <laughs> we'll do the sums. And, and in 60, and of course, I was a, a daughter of Vatican II. I, I was born with Vatican II. So the, the thing that I learned, the, the geometric form, symbol that I learned about the church was the, the concentric circles. So the way we understood the church, or we were, were, how we were taught about the relationship between the Catholic church and the other churches was with these circles. So in the circles, it's fascinating because we understood, okay, here in the center we have Christ. And of course, we affirm that we are the one truly church. And we are here the Catholics. And the one who are nearest us are the Orthodox. And then we have the Reform. We Protestants. And then we have the Jews. And then we have the Muslims. And finally, we have the non believers. So that was the scheme where how I was taught theology in what we said, okay, all of us, all the different churches are oriented towards Christ. But in one way, we defined that we were the, the ones nearer Christ, not the ones who are the, you know, the ones who are in one way have the plenitude of the truth. So that was the way which we approach a little bit 
to ecumenism. But we said, okay, and that's, that was an important step of Vatican II. We say, okay, they, these, the Orthodox, the Protestants, our, they are our brothers and sisters. Our brothers and sisters, they are really our brothers and sisters, and those churches are, are our brothers and sisters. So it was a really a, a big step in which um, relocate the Catholic Church a little bit at the core. And I think, of course, after Vatican II, there was a lot of pos positive attitude towards communism, a lot of hope, thinking that finally we will get the unity. A lot of initiatives began, the dialogues between Lutherans and, and, and Catholics, uh, Catholics and, and Reformed churches. So, the Orthodox and Catholics. But, for example, the other day I was listening to a, a video of an Orthodox theologian and he said he affirmed, well, now we are in the winter of ecumenism. So he was a little bit pessimistic about this, the actual situation of ecumenism. Um, I am actually not, not so negative, I have to say. Uh, perhaps living in New Zealand has changed my mind about ecumenism. You have to realize that I live in a country in which 98% were Catholics. Now we, have, we are 87% of Catholics, so you can imagine that I was just surrounded by Catholics and I didn't have more or less any contact with other um, churches, Christian churches or other religions. Living in New Zealand changed my perspective of ecumenism incredibly. And I will, I will also share with you the changes that have, have come through. So, but this has been a little bit the, the vision of Second Vatican Council in which it has been important because it has begun this dialogue with a lot of fruits. But now I would like to present the theory of Pope Francis about ecumenism. So he offers a new model, a new symbol, geometric symbol. His model of unity, he says, is not that of a sphere, where every point is equidistant from the center, and there are no differences between them. Instead, it is the polyhedron three-dimensional body with many angles and surfaces, which reflects the convergence of all its parts, each of which preserves its distinctiveness and seeks to gather in that polyhedron the best of each. I really think it's fascinating, this image. And I really think it helps the vision, it, it changes the vision, because before, perhaps we understood unity as, well, before Vatican II, all converting and coming to the unity to the Catholic Church. Then afterwards it was, okay, we begin a dialogue, we are brothers and sisters, and okay, each of us remain as believers in Christ, but the unity is always orientated towards Christ. But now, I think this is much more flexible and it's a vision that brings a little bit of hope of how can we understand unity? Because unity is not uniformity, but unity is that we can have different visions, different traditions, different approaches, but there is something that is the essence that is that beautiful diamond that is what we have in common. That is that we believe in Jesus Christ as the Savior. And I think that's, that's the most important thing. You know, our baptism that unites us all the Christians in, in, in who is the way, the truth, and the life. Jews into this. Yes, I will go there. I will go there. But we, okay, because this is, okay, a talk of ecumenism. I have not done a talk of the relation with other religions, but I think it's the same in one way. Why? Because the common, the common thing that all of us, all humanity we have, is the dignity 
as human beings, as being created by, by God. And it doesn't matter that a non-believer doesn't believe in God, because for me, he is image of God. So we share the same humanity and the same dignity and, you know, the same transcendence. And that is why it unites me with that person. It unites me with all humanity because what is Catholic Church? Universal. We want to embrace all humanity. And that's what God wanted. God wanted salvation for all humanity. So I think that is what unites us. So uh, this image, according to the theologian Walter Casper, Walter Casper, you knew that he was the president of, of the, um, the Pontifical Council for, for the relationship with other churches and, and, and religions. And, and he said that this, this image enables a mutual ecumenical process of learning and a complementarity, a complementary relationship that is mutual enriching. That is harmony as created by the Spirit of God. So I think really uh, Pope Francis had here a breakthrough about how in the future or how we can now live ecumenism and also the relationship with other, and we will see that with other religions. I would just would like to really, it's a long story that is not as big as I wanted, the, <laughs> but it's a, such an important uh, paragraph because for me, Evangelii Gaudium is the, the letter, the programmatic letter of Pope Francis. Really in that letter, he more or less showed us his proposal for the future of the church. And he says, try to be a church who goes forth and go to the peripheries. Try to be a church, a poor church for the poor. Try to be a church that is an ecumenical church. And here I think he sees and he has this definition of what for he is ecumenism. And he says, given the seriousness of the counter witness of division among Christians, particularly in Asia and Africa, the search for paths to unity becomes all the more urgent. Missionaries on those continents often mention the criticism, complaints, and ridicule to which the scandal of divided Christians gives rise. If we concentrate on the convictions we share, and if we keep in mind the principle of the hierarchy of truths, we will be able to progress decidedly towards common expressions of proclamation, service, and witness. The immense number of people who have not received the gospel of Jesus Christ cannot leave us indifferent. Consequently, commitment to a unity which helps them to accept Jesus Christ can no longer be a matter of mere diplomacy or false compliance but rather an indispensable path to evangelization. Signs of divisions between Christians in countries ravaged by violence add further causes of conflict on the part of those who should instead be a leaven of peace. How many important things unite us? If we really believe in the abundantly free working of the Holy Spirit, we can learn so much from one another. It is not just about being informed about others, but rather about reaping what the Spirit, the Spirit has sown in them, which is also meant to be a gift for us. To give but one example in the dialogue with our Orthodox brothers and sisters, we Catholics have the opportunity to learn more about the meaning of Episcopal collegiality and their experience of synodality. Through an exchange of gifts, the Spirit can lead, lead us even more fully into truth and goodness. I will now try to um, go in depth about this 
incredible paragraph of what he thinks about what is ecumenism. Because I think it gives us an answer about the challenges for New Zealand. The first part of the paragraph says the immense number of people who have not received the gospel of Jesus Christ cannot leave us indifferent. Consequently, commitment to a unity which helps them to accept Jesus Christ can no longer be a matter of mere diplomacy, but rather an indispensable path to evangelization. What, what is our worry? What is our, our goal as Christians? We want to share the good news. And that is why I put the title, A Possible Respond to the Situation of, of New Zealand Today. Because New Zealand is a very secularist society. And we live also, in, a, in, in particular in our world, it's a very secularized society. And I think ecumenism can be an answer. Why? Because in the past, no, the majority of the population believed in God. Christianity was practiced by the majority in the Western societies, but not now. So today, religion and faith are not the point of reference for the moral or integral life of a New Zealander. In 2018, the census said 48.6 of New Zealanders stated that they had no religion. But Christianity remains the most common religion. 37% of the population identified as Christians. So then we have the other statistics, Anglicans, Roman Catholics, Presbyterians, other affiliations, the Maori religions, beliefs, philosophies, 43,000 821 people identified with Ratana. Uh, so these are the statistics of, in, of 2018. This has been the, the ones that I have found. I have not find, found the latest ones. But um, what it shows us, it shows us that what, what is the mission of the church, of, of every church, of all the churches? We have to share the good news. And the good news is to give humanity a flourishing life. What our message is not just about that, it is about the revelation of God, but is the message of God for humanity. That is how can we are able to live um, the fulfillment of what does it mean to be human. So we have lots of people the percentage is so high. We have like 48% of the population of New Zealanders. So we are five, almost 5 million, 4 million and a half. So we have like 2 million, okay, that they do not believe in God. So we have 2 million people around us in our schools, works, um, families who have no faith and which their lives have no transcendental vision. So our mission, and, and this is interesting because as, as the, the philosopher Charles Taylor said in his book, The Secular Age, well, in the past, no one believed that you can be happy just in an immanent position. We have now a situation in which people can have no reference to God and feel that they are satisfied and that they are happy and that they don't need religion. I remember working at Rest Home, for me it was a shock, cultural shock, because coming from a country in which the majority are religious, I remember working the first year here in New Zealand, working at Rest Home, an old guy told me, no, I will die, everything finishes there, and I don't need God, and I am okay, and I am fine. And he really felt fine, and I was so surprised about it. You know, he felt that he was all right, that he had a good life, that he loved the people around him, that he worked hard, and that he would die and everything would finish there. So for me, it was like a cultural shock to see how it's possible not, ha not having the, the, the perception of uh, another life, after this life of a spiritual dimension. And Charles Taylor said, it is not because of technology. 
Modernity is not because of modernity. It's not because of the science. He says, what it has happened in, in our world is the lack of sensitivity towards the spiritual and dimension towards God. So it's the lack, he says, of imagination. Because of course, for being a, a believer or for believing in God, you need to imagine, you need to use symbols. You, when we believe in Christ, we need to think of ourselves being better persons. That's lots of imagination, to <laughs> believing in ourselves being holy. So we have to imagine and we have to transform. But all, the, all our beliefs need these symbols, this reality that open us to something else, to something beyond us. But of course, in a materialistic, consumeristic society, and in contact with no contact with nature, with no contact with yourself, you are not able to touch the innermost part of yourself who is thirsty of God, who is thirsty of something else, who, is, who gives meaning, sense, and, and, and density to your life. So really, our work as Christians, and that's why I think it's a response, ecumenism I think is really an answer for our times, I think ecumenism can respond awakening, awakening that desire for God. Because people are numbed. And of course, when the crisis comes, when you lose, lose a person, when you, you lose your job, when that pandemic comes to us, then you feel that that happiness that you had has no sense. And lots of depression and people who, have, who feel terribly sad and depressed and with no sense, and we come here, all Christians together. And that is why I think it is so important. First, as a personal level, I have to say for me, <laughs> living in a, in a Catholic church, when I came, came here and it was, strange for me that when I, I remember myself uh, the first year I put my nativity set in, in Lima in Christmas you have all the city with nativity sets wherever you turn there is a nativity set so when I went here to visit that street full of lights there was no not just one nativity set I was so sad there were just angels but I was so sad but I remember a kid of five years old came to my house and he was a friend of us and, and the little kid so my nativity said, and he said, he asked, who are those? So, and he was eight years old, so he had no idea that was, well, I had to explain. So I said, oh my goodness, how I explain my nativity said to someone that has no idea of, of the faith, of Christian faith. So for me, it was interesting because what happens to me now, I have to say, I didn't leave a communism before. It was just theoretical, but it was not a lived reality. And I have to say that New Zealand has helped me because here, first, when I find, I remember when I find a taxi driver who, asks, who tells me, yes, I, ah, you, you are a theologian. I am an evangelical and I, well, I feel so happy to share with someone who believes in Jesus and we have the same faith. So it's so, it's fascinating to me that I have never felt that connection before with, with other communities. And now, living in a secular society as New Zealand, I feel incredibly connected. And I think that is why ecumenism can help us, first, to strengthen our faith in a very difficult situation in which, you have, in which our identity is really, we are losing our identity because we are immersed in this globalized, secularist society. So first, I think it strengthens our identity. But second, gives us that beautiful mission together to share with, with all this society that does not believe in God, uh, that they can have this hope, that we can share this joy. So really, I have to say, I don't care who does the job. So if I see a, a, 
uh, Orthodox, Evangelical, whoever, proclaiming the, the, the message of Jesus, I am so happy, you know, and I am really, I really, I am joyful. And I think that's ecumenism, because the most imp important thing is what, it un what unites us, not what divides us. So, um, um, I have seen, I have said that. So that's why I think it's a source, ecumenism is a source of brotherhood and sisterhood and a way of strengthening our Christ Christian identity. But also create an alternative message for all those who have the necessity of awakening a spiritual need. And I will talk about that, but also ecumenism, I think, is an incredible, incredible tool for our mission. Our mission, as Francis said, is to be a poor church for the poor, but not just in an assistential way, but to give voice, he said in Evangelium, Evangelium Gaudium, to give voice to those who have no voice. Yes, you have heard that I work with victims of sexual abuse within the Catholic Church, but I work, my work of researcher, I work with an Anglican priest, and I, am, I have given last year a workshop with to Anglican priests and Anglican ministers because we are giving voice to the victims, and that's our mission as Christians. Our mission is to try to build little by little the kingdom of God here in earth. And the job and the mission is immense. And it's so beautiful when we united our, our forces. And now we are publishing a book that will come now in March about, about also uh, victims of sexual abuse. And the ones who have participated in the book, the ones who have written are Catholics, Anglicans, Protestants, Evangelicals from South Africa, we have from all the churches and all of us, we have united for one cause. That is be the voice of the ones who have no voice. And that is what Jesus asked of us. So we are doing ecumenism. So I am a believer that it's not a winter of ecumenism. I don't believe that. I really think that it's a springtime. I feel like that because I have never seen so such initiatives from different churches working together. And it's fascinating. So, another element, so one, I think, for the challenge of New Zealand is the topic of, um, I have to see the hour, so I don't, the topic of, of uh, secularism, but another is the variety of cultures. I think also, also the Pope says, signs of division between Christians in countries ravaged by violence add further causes of conflict on the part of those who should instead be a leaven of peace. So, we know that in many countries the differences between Christians and religions have created and between uh, races have been a source for violence and division. And here in New Zealand, no, we, we just think about that horrible event of the terrorist attack in, in the mosque. And it, I think it, may, it, it was very interesting when we Catholics, in, we, I live in front of Vermont Street, in front of the mosque. So um, the Iman invited all of us, invited the seminary and all of us to go to a service to the mosque. And I have to say, it's the first time in my life that I enter a mosque. And I was, you know, it was like a new world for me. And I said, I have lived in front and I never do, you know? And it is so interesting because it made me, it questioned my attitude towards people who have different faiths. And it questioned my attitude because also they came to the Catholic Church and they came to a service of the liturgy in our parish. And it was absolutely beautiful. And I realize that sometimes here in New Zealand, we have all those different cultures. We have Muslims, Jews, Protestants, 
all type of churches. I have never seen so much churches like in New Zealand in my life, all, all, all type of churches and denominations. But actually, what I think is interesting is that the variety, of, the multiculturalism comes together with ecumenism. Because ecumenism helps to respect the enriched by the different people, by the different faiths, and also and helps multiculturalism. So while other societies fight because of their differences, because I think we human beings, we are strange people. We really don't like differences. We are weird. We are weird. And I don't know why we don't accept the weirdness of the others. All of us, we are weird by thinking, oh, he's different. No, I am different too, <laughs> so all of us. But we always think that the others are different. But I only really think that each human being is a mystery. And we are so different, but we feel threatened. We like to be with the people that are like us. And I think the world is changing. Now we have this multicultural society, and I think it's beautiful. I think we have to use uh, and embrace what is happening in New Zealand. It's fascinating. You know, the fact that you have, in, uh, today in my class, uh, I had, we were seven different nationalities, all of us. And I was talking about, about enculturation, and each person uh, had a different commentary about how to enculturate the gospel in their own culture. It was amazing. I have never had a class like that. So I said to myself, this is the richness of the difference. And that is why I think that sometimes we are like afraid of something that is different. We want uh, people thinking like us, doing like us. But reality is so rich that we cannot have just one vision. It's, the truth is too infinite. So you have like the polyedron, on different angles, different views. And we have to try to combine and try to live and to build peace. And so it, it is interesting, I think, the fact that um, there is a theologian, it says, uh, this is Jean-Marie Tillard, uh, a communical theologian, and he says, both ecumenism and multiculturality underline the diversity within the unity of the church. Both point to the nature of Catholicity. And we have a challenge here. We have the challenge of how to create a church that is open to the different cultures and that does not isolate the communities. Today I was talking with this with my students because they were saying some communities, for example, the Latin Americans, they're all together. I am a Latin American and we have a mass together. And, and I, I try also to not to just go there because it, it, you can become an isolated community. So if I'm in New Zealand, I have to be enriched by the New Zealand culture and have to be enriched also by other cultures. So how do we build this? I think also both of them, ecumenism helps multiculturalism and multiculturalism helps ecumenism. So that's why I think ecumenism is a response for our world, our, our globalized world. I will just... Um, show you just a few elements um, to finish and then begin the dialogue uh, of what the ecumenical perspective of Francis, of Pope Francis. Um, he considered that it is an indispensable path for evangel to evangelization, as I read in the paragraph. But I think I love when he says, is joining together. He created that word in Italian, because the, Ita in the Italian word doesn't exist, and he created it because he is always inventing words because he doesn't speak incredible Italian. So, but what it says, it is an, an encounter. So he proposes an ecumenism of encounter, ecumenism in which both of us change. So it's not just that I will change you; it's that both of us change in that encounter. And the most important thing is to listen more than to respond. So I think the attitude is that, not of arrogance, it's a very humble ecumenism. 
in which I, and I, I think it's fascinating. <laughs> we were last year, we were in a conference. Lisa, you were also there in an Satfe conference. That was a conference organized um, by an association of theologians, of pastoral theologians, and they were from different churches. So in one activity was okay. He's um, the, the one who was animating said, okay, now we will have a moment of prayer. So you will choose the one who is near you and you will bless each other. So in the moment, the one who I had beside me was a, a Catholic priest from Australia that I know. So, so all the, the, the couples, no? began to, to do the blessing. So the Catholic priest immediately blessed me, no, oh, Rocio, I bless you and bless all your family. And so I said, okay, Father, I bless you, I bless all your work, your mission, and we finish. And all the others that were from different churches were talking and talking and, and they were just inspired. And we were like looking at them, we move and say, we are Catholics. So it was so funny because we realized that we are like, like we talk, blessing, that's it, we don't need more. And they were, for example, inspired by the world and they were inspired in the moment. And really, I have to say that that encounter helped me so much, you know, um, nurtured so much. So I think that sometimes um, that, that the path for, for ecumenism is humility. What can I learn from you? Um, what can I learn from your experience of faith, of God, of, of yourself, of your life, of your history? And that's what Pope Francis proposes, a ecumenism of dialogue and friendship. It is interesting when, when, when when Pope Francis wrote his first autobiography, when he was a cardinal, he asked Scorca, the, the rabbi of Argentina, to make the prologue, the prologue. And Scorca says, I couldn't believe that he asked a Jewish rabbi to, because he's my friend and he listens what I say. So he was absolutely touched and he said, this is ecumenism. It's not big steps. It's a path of dialogue and friendship and joining together. And of course, we have to believe that the Spirit will come and the Spirit will, little by little, do that unity. We are already united. Ecumenism has already happened. We are united in Christ. We are the humans that we discuss, we fight. But God has saved us. God has already given this gift of unity. Now we have to work and, and not stopping, working for unity and enriching us. And of course, I think it's interesting to see what's going on that is not moving. Huh? Oh, here it is. Okay, so it says something that I like it, that he says um, in the Patriarchal Church in Istanbul, Pope Francis said, meeting each other, seeing each other face, exchanging the embrace of peace, praying for each other, all essential aspects of our journey toward the restoration of full communion. All of these precedes and always accompany the other ex essential aspects of this journey, the theological dialogue. An authentic dialogue is in every case an encounter between persons with a name, a face, a past, and not merely a meeting of ideas. I think that sometimes we have left the communism just to the theological discussions between theologians about what we believe and what we agree and we are not, do not agree. Yes, our difference, and we do not have to deny the differences. We have to accept the differences. And we don't have to say, oh, we are all the same. We are all the same. We are different. We have different traditions. We have different approaches. We have different dogmas. And there are things that, yeah, that, that are not the same. And we have to respect and try to little by little, comp for example, the last uh, document about the joint declaration of justification, little by little we have to realize, oh, we are not so different regarding justification. There are no things similar than different. Okay, so justification has been one element that we have gone through. But of course there are many others. And little by little this theological dialogue has to continue. 
because of course we are not able to discuss with the other if we do not affirm our identity so we have to be okay what is our identity as catholics and we know what is our identity as catholics but with my identity i go and i am open to see okay why can i receive how can i be rich i will not change my uh, my 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 doctrine my views but i can i can change my approach i can change my the angles the nuances the subtle little topics and i can really be enriched by the others so i think that's a big and that is why uh, i think we have to talk about the different types of ecumenism a daily ecumenism of ecumenism of encounter i think this is the most important one and this is the one that we as common mortals <laughs> not the theologians but the that the catholics and, and believers we have to work daily because the beautiful thing here in new zealand is every day you find people from other faiths other churches and other religions and we can live this daily ecumenism that uh, that is made of gestures and symbols and attitudes second the ecumenism on service as i was telling you our mission let's concentrate it in why we are here what the unity the visible unity is not an end in itself the church doesn't exist because of itself we exist because our mission is to give life to others is to help others to flourish so let's unite with the others to do our mission so i'm really so happy that we have these initiatives with all the, in my case as a theologian i say okay i will work with other theologians in order and we i have now networks with lots of lots of theologians from different confessions and i love it and i really feel that we are working together in a mission so what we have to ask is okay myself in my situation how can i work in my mission with other others brothers and sisters from other faiths other communities other churches and third the doctrinal ecumenism so of course this has to continue as he says that these theological discussions but there was a um there was a congress in in georgetown, U, georgetown university about ecumenism no and there were all two cardinals one lutheran bishop two cardinals and one contemplative nun so all they were talking about ecumenism and this contemplative nun said well i have to say something at the end no? she said she's very, very humble she said well we have to ask what is the pope francis says talks about ecumenism as taking into consideration the hierarchy of truths who is the truth jesus who is jesus mercy so really the most important truth is mercy and mercy can be lived can be lived and believed for all of us if we have that truth as the first truth we are okay <laughs> i was amazed by that response i loved it because it's true and he said some, she said something that also hit me because she said and the problem is that all the communism has been done in the last centuries by men and i don't want to criticize men they are nice but usually they use more the rational part the logic part sometimes women we use more a little bit more the intuitive part and the intuitive part doesn't go to all the logics of the hierarchy it goes to the result the result is love the result is mercy and then and it's contemplation in contemplation we are already in communion with god it really impressed me because it's not that it's not important to talk about what we believe but actually what is the main truth god as communion of love exactly exactly and finally of course the communism in prayer you no know, because we believe and i think that's why i am not a pessimistic we believe in the holy spirit it's a gift the unity is a gift of the holy spirit it's not a work that we can do by ourselves.
Of course, we have to help the Holy Spirit. And um, well, with that, I, I finish. Well so.